We are glad to be in the house of God. Hallelujah. Yes, Thank God for him, him allowing us to come together in his name. Yeah. Praise God. So it is November the 11th, 2020. Thank God. The day that the Lord has made. Right. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it, you know. And so we thank God tonight. Uh, we serve an awesome God. And uh, we've been learning about, over in Genesis chapter 16, that our God is the God who sees. He sees us. So does anyone, sometimes, you know, people ask themselves questions, does anybody care about me? Does anyone know what I'm going through? Have you ever asked a question like that? Do you say, you know what, I wonder, does God see me? The answer is yes. <laughs> he definitely sees you. The Bible says that even the hairs of your head are numbered. You're more valuable than just, you know, birds or anything because he's even interested in the birds. He takes an intimate interest in you. We know that from Psalm 139. And also, you know what else? God knows your name. Yeah. He knows you by name. Not only that, God knows exactly where you are, and he knows exactly what your situation is. Your situation might have surprised you, but it didn't surprise him. That's right. It didn't come upon him unaware, so we thank God. You know what else? God sees your need. He promises that he will never leave us nor I'll forsake understand. us. So whatever we're going through, God is there with us. So. God sees you, he sees exactly what you're going through, and he knows you by name, and he cares for you. I want you to be encouraged tonight. We thank God. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you, Father, for your uh, amazing grace. Thank you for this time that's been set aside to come and to worship you. So we know a lot of things went on today, oh God, but we're setting those aside. And we're focusing in on you, oh God. I thank you, Lord, for this precious time that's been set aside. You have a purpose for tonight. Father, I thank you for helping us to get right in the middle of your will. Father, thank thank you you for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for encouraging us. And then help us as we return the praise and the worship to you, oh God. You're the focus of our affection. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Not like 
yesterday and I was like I did yeah All and right. so I'm like oh man today's the 11th so I call and I told the guy I said man I thought today I said I messed up and you know what the favor of God I didn't have to pay a late fee and I praise God for that now that may seem small to a lot of you guys but I hate paying late fees that just ugh. but anyways the favor of God so you got to look for God sometimes down in the creases and the crevices because he's there and he knows that that meant a lot to me, and he took care of that. I just praise God for that. I know that sounds silly, but I praise God for that.
work in me. I'm broken gracefully. I'm strong when I am weak. I will be free. Your power at work in me. I'm broken gracefully. I'm strong when
I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Dear Lord, Jesus, you're all I need. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, that um, the trials that come. I thank God because over in Deuteronomy 8, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says that he led the children of Israel out there into the wilderness, that he might prove what was in them. See, he already knew what was in them. But the wilderness was going to prove, the desert places were going to prove to them what was in them. They needed to know what was in them. God already knew. So the wilderness and the desert and the trials have a purpose. We thank God for that. Hallelujah. Because the process that he's taken us through has a purpose. God knows all things. And so what we do is we trust him through the desert. We trust him through the wilderness with our eyes on the promised land with our eyes on the promise. And you say, my God, why am I still out here in the desert? Why am I still out here in the wilderness when I can see the promise just ahead? Because God has a purpose. The Bible says the trying of our faith is more precious than gold. What's precious to Jesus? What does he care about? The trying of our faith. Because he says in our patience, we possess our souls. There's a purpose for the desert. There's a purpose for the wilderness. There's a purpose for the waiting because God's working something in us. He knows what's in us, but we don't know what's in us until the heat is turned up, until there's no water anywhere in sight. When it looks like the provision has dried up, that's when we look to the hills from which cometh our help. Our help cometh from the Lord. Our God never slumbers, nor does he sleep. Does God see us? Yes, he does. Does he know what we're going through? Yes, he does. Does he care about us? Yes, he does. Our God. There's none like him. There's no God greater than our God. That's why we say he's king of kings and Lord of lords, because there's none higher than our God. I thank God tonight. I pray that you would be encouraged. You may have your seat. We thank God tonight. Jesus is all we need. Literally, he's all our need. You know, because if we need food, he's the bread from heaven. Hallelujah. If we need peace, he's the king of peace. If we need healing, his name is Jesus. If we need deliverance, his name is Jesus. Whatever you can put a name on it, it's Jesus. <laughs> He's everything that we need. We thank God tonight. Amen. We are blessed to be in his presence. Hallelujah. We're a blessed people. Hallelujah. I'm often reminded that we're not in this place of our own doing. If God hadn't given us a mind to be here, we would not be here. <laughs> you know. But it's him that gives us space. He's the one that gave us grace. He even gave us the faith to believe on him. All of it came from him. And we thank God tonight. Well, we want to welcome you to the house of prayer. We praise God. We thank God for all those that are here among us. Are there any first-time visitors with us at all? First time in the house of God? No? Okay, well, we thank God for all those that are joining us via Facebook and BoxCast. And we thank God for you. Thanks for joining in with us tonight. We're excited about what God has for us. Hallelujah. Well, today is Veterans Day. Yeah. We don't want to be remiss. We want to honor all of our veterans. If you were in the military at all, would you stand? Here in the sanctuary, would you stand? And we want to give honor to whom honor is due. We appreciate you. Now, we know there's many watching us that also have served in the armed forces. We want to give a big shout out to you. Thank God for your service to our country and to us. We appreciate you. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank God for that, you know, just the space to be able to do that. Isn't that awesome? People that are willing to lay down their lives for others, you know, we thank God for that. 
Well, there's a lot going on, as always, at the House of Prayer. So we have some announcements. Thank you, Lord. Wednesday, November 11th, 2020. The Women of Hope will continue their jar drive until Sunday, December 13th. This has been extended. So stop by after service, pick up a present for a loved one or a neighbor, or even for yourself. They're selling them eight for eight dollars for one, fifteen dollars for two, and I believe, if I'm not wrong, the proceeds go to help out families here at the House of Prayer, uh, families that need Christmas gifts. So it's a good fundraiser. And also this Sunday coming up, we got a turkey costume contest. <laughs> oh, come on, guys, you can do better now. We, oh, somebody's gobbling over here right here. Turkey costume contest is coming up. Prizes for the top three adult costumes. Junior, how come you ain't up here doing this? Hey, don't you do announcements? <laughs> you do, huh? You do this. No, oh, Sunday's only. <laughs> Turkey costume contest this Sunday. Prizes for the top three adult costumes. I went and picked them up. There's some good prizes. It's worth yeah. you going for. And then they're going to have toys and prizes uh, for the kids for participating. So come dress to have some fun. Woo. Isn't that cool? Amen. God allows us to have fun. Thank you, Jesus. Ain't that something? Thank you, Lord. I always like what pastors say. We don't want to walk around looking like we was baptized in a pickle barrel. Right. That ain't going to draw too many people. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So we want to have fun. We praise God. And if you do not have a Thanksgiving dinner to go to, please come and spend Thanksgiving with us. Don't spend Thanksgiving by yourself. Please don't do that. Come and fellowship with us here at the House of Prayer. I believe that's Thursday. It's not on here. November what? 25th? 26th. On 26th. At 12 noon, we'll have down in the kitchen, which is down that sidewalk right there. And they will have plenty of food. The church is providing all the food. All you have to do is come and fellowship and have fun with us, okay? And you can see Miss Paula Clark right here. If, she's got to wave her hand so you know. <laughs> if you uh, have any questions, see her. Is the sign-up sheet still up? Should be. Yeah. So that if you think you're coming, can you put it on there so she can plan for how many people? are coming. But, you know, don't let that stop you. If you don't have some place to go, please come. Please come and have Thanksgiving with us. So we have prayer on the square, Saturday, November 14th at 9 a.m. And uh, so if you have questions about that, I believe you could probably call Michelle or possibly Miss Georgette. Are you going to be there? So they could talk to you if they have questions. Miss Georgette will, can answer questions also about prayer on the square, 9 a.m. Well, we have our regular services, Monday night Bible study at 7 p.m. Praise God. We have, of course, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Who We Are in Christ, uh, Bible study on Saturday at 3 p.m. And then our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. I'm telling you, if you need somewhere to go, this parking lot usually has cars. And I believe we also have 12-step going on, right? Sunday at what time? At 1 o'clock. So please, if you need somewhere to go, come here. We're usually here. <laughs> we, we welcome you to come and join us. So we thank God for that. So now is the time when everybody gets to participate, and we're going to take up our offering. Would you stand with us? We're going to take up an offering. Praise God. Another way for us to praise and worship God with our giving. And we like to lift our offering up and speak the word over it. Praise God, which is in Luke 6, 38. So if you'll get your offering in your hand, hold it up to the Lord. <laughs> Thank God for the ability to give. Ain't God good? Amen. <laughs> so we're going to say the scripture, repeat after me. Luke 6, 38 says, give, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shaken together. And running over, and running over shall, men give shall men give unto your bosom. Unto your bosom. For, with the same measure For with the same measure that you give, that you give it shall be given unto you again. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Pastor Tony, would you pray over our offering, please, sir? Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, we thank God tonight. We thank God for the Word of God. Amen. Pastor Larry has a message, a series actually, to share with us about the armor of God. And we certainly want to be suited up and ready for what God has for us. So we thank God for our pastor. Praise All right. God. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Amen. You know, I know, uh, you know, during these uh, troubled times, a lot of people are fearful, a lot of people are troubled, but uh, I'm excited. I really am. I'm excited. You know, I believe these are birth pains to what's coming, the Lord, and that's Jesus. He's coming back, and, and uh, these are uh, signs. It's all been prophesied hundreds of years ago, and... I know my Savior is going to show up at any moment. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, I believe we all know or should know that we are living in the last of the last days. And that we certainly are in a warfare. Amen. Praise God. And I believe as we can see all around us by the signs of the times that according uh, to Bible prophecy, Satan has pulled out all the stops using every means of treachery, lies, and most of all, in these last days, deception. Deception. So that he may, as John 10, 10, so clearly tells us, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So the scripture warns us here in 1 Timothy 4 and 1 that there will be an apostasy in the church. There will be a falling away. That's what that word means, apostasy. There will be a falling away of believers, those who have grown weary in well-doing. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, The Holy Spirit distinctly and very expressly declares that in the latter days, some will depart from the faith. Some will depart from the faith. Does this mean that they've stopped believing in God? No, they just don't have the faith to live for God because of the times that we live in. Giving heed to or giving their attention to Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, we got a whole lot of that going on in the world today. Yes. Amen? And also, as the Word of God warns us in Matthew 24, 24, to deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect. That's how, that's how strong the deception will be. That's how strong that these seducing spirits will be carrying out their plan. All right? So we live in a serious time, but there's still a lot of people today that just want to take the ostrich approach. They just want to bury their heads in the sand and say, well, if it ain't happening to me and mine, I'll just ignore it. A lot of Christians today, they think that spiritual warfare is some kind of game that we're playing with the devil. They've adopted the idea that, well, maybe if I don't bother the devil, he won't bother me. But the truth is, with that kind of an attitude, they're already bothered, all right? And they don't know it because he's already deceived them into being right where he wants them, saved, sanctified, and petrified, all right? Amen. Serious time. The truth is, we're not playing a game, but we are involved in a very serious warfare. The book of Revelations... John writes in chapter 12, verse 12, he says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he has but a short time. You know, the enemy, he still thinks that he can pull a rabbit out of the hat. He's real, he's real serious about this. Because, see, he's deceived himself. Pride entered into Lucifer, and he became so deceived within himself. Pride can, don't ever underestimate 
the power of pride. First Peter 5 and 8 tells us, so be sober, to be vigilant, be serious, for your adversary the devil is going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You know, I've watched enough uh, jungle movies and safari movies and all that that you know that the, uh, the wild animals always pick off the what? The weak ones, right? And that's what he's looking for. Those that have separated themselves from the, the fold, those who think that they can do this all by themselves, those that think that, uh, you know, they've fallen uh, victim to uh, the doctrine of secular humanism that's in the world today, that we can find our answer in our universities and in our schools of, of uh, knowledge and so forth. But you know what? The only place we're going to find it is in the Bible because that is the beginning of wisdom is to fear God and to follow his commandments, to follow his directions. That's where it all begins. That's where it all starts. Praise God. Jesus told Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to devour you. He wants to sift you like wheat. Satan's after you, Peter. He wants to sift you from the kingdom of God. He wants to steal the life out of you, Peter. And the truth is, Satan wants to do the same thing to you and me. All right? That's what he wants. The thing is, Satan wants to destroy our usefulness for God. Amen? He doesn't, you know, okay, you can go to church. I won't bother you in that. And no, you can go ahead and carry your Bible just for Pete's sake. Don't read it. Don't get involved. That's what he wants. Many years ago, I, uh, I rode with a club out of Chicago called Hell's Henchmen. And they had the motto of their club was, uh, I'd rather reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And being one that was raised up in church, I mean, even at, in the height of all my junk and, and heathenism and all that, that was just a little, I'm thinking, you know what, that's the height of pride right there. That is so, that is uh, such deception. I'd rather rain. There ain't going to be no raining in hell except for hell's fire is going to be raining. That's for sure. Yes, but I think you spell that a little differently, right? All right yeah. But today I got good news. Anybody ready for some good news? Okay. I got good news for you. The good news is the bad news don't have to be true. All right. All right. Because Jesus pulled the devil's teeth some 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary. And he made an open show of the devil's defeat. He took our bad debt and he nailed it to the cross. Amen? So when the enemy comes around trying to remind you of, of how wicked you used to be or maybe how wicked you are, you know, he tries everything. You know, he's going to see if you, you know, it's about like Frank and Mike says, you know, uh, from the pickers, he just, he just throws something against the wall to see if it's a stick. You know, see if you're going to bite into it, right? See if you're going to believe it or not. Well, I just asked the devil, I don't know what you're talking about. I got a clean slate. Amen? You know, that word remission in the Bible, that doesn't mean just forgiveness. That means blotted out. He took our sins and he blotted them out. He expunged our record. There's, there's a blank page there. Amen? Isn't that, isn't that great? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right. And if you're a blood-bought, sold-out, born-again believer, you don't have to stand idly by and watch the devil run rampant through your life and through your family's life and through your household. It don't have to be that way. Because with his life's blood, Jesus not only purchased our salvation, but he's also given us power to be more than overcomers in this life. Amen. Amen. That's past tense. Praise God. So when we look at John 16 and 33, 
Yes, Jesus said in the world you shall have tribulation. But he said, I want you to know that you can be of good cheer. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. Why is that? Because he says, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. So the point being here, because Jesus overcame the world, we can be overcomers in this life also. All right? Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him. Past tense. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Amen. So the Bible says they overcame him. How's that going to happen? Well, first of all, it only happens through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You know, I'm reminded of where Jesus sent the boys out and he gave them power over demon spirits or devils. The word demon isn't in the King James Bible, but you'll, you'll find, I think, devils in there about 70 sometimes. And uh, so he sent them out with power to cast out devils. And when they came back, of course, they were excited and they were telling Jesus, oh, even, even the demons, even the devils are subject to us. Well, you know, Jesus says, calm down, guys. Just calm down, you know. Rejoice not just because the devils are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Yeah. You know, praise God. Amen. They didn't know what was coming up, but through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, he paid the price. He did it all. Amen. And so by our confession, through the confession of our faith, by our actively resisting the devil, we can fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Paul said, I fought a good fight. And when he retired, you know, he didn't die. He just retired and went on to life eternal, right? Praise God. So 1 John 4 and 4 says, you are of God, little children. Now, is that true or not? Amen? Are we excited? All right. Good. All right. He said, and have overcome them. Overcome who? Demonic forces, devils. Why? How? Because greater is he that is within you than he that's within the world. This is the temple that he resides in now. This temple here. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul says. Amen. He and greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. Now, I've always believed that and always said that, uh, that the greatest defense is always being on the offense. Okay? I think that that is part of being prepared. You know, take the battle to it. You know, instead of there's a lot of Christians that wake up every morning and they're afraid to crawl out from under the bed, not from just crawling out of bed because... The enemies put fear into their life. But you know what? He's the one. He's the one that ought to be really worried every time we get out of bed in the morning. I believe that. You know, uh, years ago, I think, uh, uh, I can't remember what year it was, but Edgewood had a really good football team. And I believe uh, it was the regionals that they went to. And they had a playoff with Tell City. I went to that game. And um, wow. Wow. I mean, we had a football team. At halftime, Edgewood was ahead 26 to nothing. Met this team. I mean, it was just like, where'd these guys come from, you know? Well, after halftime was over, they came out. It was a totally different Edgewood football team. And I can just about hear the coach. Let's just hold on to the lead. We're not going to play. He didn't come out and say, I'm sure that we're not going to play offense anymore. He just said, let's hold on to what we got. They never scored another point. They got beat 27 to 26. So I believe a good defense is a good offense. We're armed with the word of God. We're going to talk about that armor tonight, about putting on the whole armor of God. Amen. And, and in case you didn't know, you know, it was a few years back when we had started the house of prayer out here on the hillside, I sent out an open challenge to the people of the Ellettsville community to let them know whose side we're on, all right? This is what I had put in the journal, and I ran it for several weeks. 
The Ellettsville House of Prayer invites you to come and enjoy praise and worship that's going to take you out of this world. Right? Are you looking for a church that's literally, that literally keeps Satan hiding under his bed, that isn't afraid to storm the gates of hell? Come and check it out. Experience Christianity in action. And I still believe that. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross, he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane praying arduously. He came back to check on the boys. They were all asleep. They were all asleep. Jesus is getting ready to come back. Where's his disciples at? Today, are they asleep? Are they asleep? We have to ask ourselves that question. So, praise God. Well, that's who we are. And for the next few weeks, we're going to be taking our text from the book of Ephesians in the sixth chapter where the Apostle Paul tells us that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all about this warfare that's going on and who it's really with and how we're supposed to fight it. Amen. And if you expect to win it, the Bible tells us just exactly what to do. Amen. Praise God. So, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. Paul tells us, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, the devil's been at this for a while. He has studied mankind. He knows our weaknesses. That's where he dangles his, dangles the, I don't, used to be a carrot. I'd say it's probably a cheeseburger now. It's where he dangles the temptation, trying to lure us, all right? He's smart. He's subtle, all right? He says here, Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities. We wrestle against powers, against the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. These are rank and file, starting off with the lowly principalities and then the powers, then the darkness of this world, and then spiritual wickedness in high places. All right? He goes on to say, Therefore, for this reason, this is why, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger. Now, that evil day that Paul is talking about there, he's talking about today. He's talking about the latter times, the last days, the evil day. And he goes on to say in the King James, and having done all to stand, that's our part, Stand. Actually, that last part is God's part because the Old Testament says, Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Amen? Praise God. Or the Amplified says, After having done all that the crisis or the situation demands, stand firmly in your place. Don't give up your place. Don't give place to the devil, Paul says. He wants your place. Amen? He suckered Adam and Eve out of their place. He lied to Eve, all right? You know the story. And so he wants to do the same with us. He don't want us to believe that everything about the cross is true, and, and a lot of people in this world has bought into that. He don't want us to look to the cross. He don't want us to know about the blessings and the benefits and the promises that God has made to us. So if he can just kind of keep us held down, held back, you know, then he's, he's satisfied. Well, in, in, uh, in 1982, when I got involved in jail and prison ministry, don't you know that all hell began to break loose in my life? I'm just telling you this because in, when you get involved in frontline ministry, you know, if you're on the front line of the battle, you're going to get shot at. The enemy's going to throw some darts at you. He's going to throw everything he's got at you. And so... That's what was going on. And so I started getting a real taste of what frontline ministry was all about. And, you know, and for so many years of, of uh, physical barroom fighting, you know, I had to learn how to get down on my knees and fight like a man. Amen? A man of God. I had to fight spiritually. 
against oppressing demonic forces. You say, well, how did you do that? Well, I got a, I got a lesson uh, one night. We, uh, we left out, Carl Beadle and I think Wes Powell and myself, and there was four of us in the car. We were going to Michigan City Prison to, uh, to do a weekend thing up there. And uh, we finally, uh, we had left, I think, on a Friday evening, and, and it was getting late. It was starting to, starting to rain, so we, we stayed at a motel just outside town, and, and uh, there was no uh, pop machines or anything like that or any place to get water. And so I had uh, got up and, and uh, told Carl I was going to use the car to drive into town and find me something to drink. I mean, it was raining. It was raining. I mean, the animals were beginning to pair up. You couldn't see hardly nothing. And so I'm in the car. I'm going up the road, and the windshield wipers is on 78 RPM, you know. And, and uh, I saw one headlight coming, and I'm just really fighting to see if it's a motorcycle, if some dude got caught out in the rain, or if it's a... Uh, what do you call it? A padiddle? Is that is that a, when you have a headline out? That's what we used to call it in school. But I couldn't tell where the car was at. I just saw the headlight. And so about the time that I saw this and it was coming, I hear this voice from inside the car. And I mean, it was so, so audible. And I don't know if it was, but all I heard was, I'm going to kill you. And it was so real that I wanted to look. I mean, you know, the, the headlights coming, the windshield wipers are going, and I'm, I'm going to kill. He said it about three times. And I'm just, it was a distraction, and he get, got me to keep turning my head. Well, it was a car, and the, the part of the car with the headlight out was in my lane. And it was just, I mean, it was a narrow hit. And I had gotten off the road and missed it, and I sat there for a little bit. I was really angry. I said, you lying devil, you ain't going to do anything to me. you got to get permission from my heavenly father. I mean, it was just coming right up out of my belly, and I was unloading on him. And I thought, you know, shades of things to come. That was, uh, what, 36 years ago. I'm still here. So... There's a warfare going on, all right? So uh, since then, he's hit me with every kind of intimidation that you can possibly think of. And I said all that to say this. If or when you get in a place where you get confused, not knowing exactly what God is saying to you or what you're supposed to do or what he wants you to do, just do what the Bible says. Just do what the Word of God says. Make it simple, real quick. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. How do you do that? Get in the Word. Get your face in the Word. Amen. Put on the whole armor of God. Whose armor are we supposed to put on? That's right. He doesn't say to put your armor on. No, because we don't have any armor. We don't. Isaiah 64 and 6 says, Our righteousness is but filthy rags. I mean, we'd be like chasing the devil in, in our underwear and charging the gates of hell with a squirt gun in our righteousness. Right? So, it says for us to put on God's armor and keep it on. You know, there's another thing. I've heard people say, Well, that's the first thing I do every morning. I put on the whole armor of God. And I say, Why do you take it off? That sounds kind of crazy. I don't know about you, but he'll try to come at me at nighttime. So I keep his armor on all the time. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. And I've said so many times before, the devil's not afraid of us, but he is terrified. James 2, 19, one of my favorite verses. He is terrified of the presence of the God who lives in me. Amen. James 2, 19, thou believest in one God. You do very well because the devil also believes and he trembles. He trembles. Amen. He can't stand the word. We're going to talk about that tonight. Okay. So God's not left us defenseless. And I'm sure what the Apostle Paul, in writing to us about 
this whole armor of God. He must have been thinking about the armor that the Roman soldiers wore at that time, the physical armor that they wore. But in comparison, he knew that in order to fight and to overcome spiritual powers, to overcome demonic forces, that we had to be suited up in God's armor to fight a spiritual enemy. Are you with me tonight? So Paul continues to write here, describing each piece of the armor of God. And I'm, also just, I'm just going to tell you up front, you can see how when we, as we go through each piece of armor in the next few weeks, that you can see every single piece of armor that, is, that Paul talks about points to Jesus Christ, is putting on Jesus, putting on Jesus. All right? Amen. So, here in Ephesians 6, verse 14, he says, Stand therefore, not naked, having your loins girt about with truth. Okay? Now, this, this belt of truth, what we need to realize here, God provides the belt, but we got to put it on. All right? Okay. So this, uh, this, this belt to, to gird ourselves about with the truth, I mean, it was uh, this, uh, this belt actually tied everything together. It was right here in the center of the armor, okay? It provided support to the body, this, this physical piece of armor did, and uh, it, held this, it held this sword and... Uh, it, it added soundness to the uniform that they wore. And uh, so it was, it was a piece of armor that was very much needed. So now, first of all, without truth, he says, having your loins girt about with truth. So without truth, there's no stability. There's no bracing. Without truth, there would be no foundation in living a healthy and a prosperous life. Truth supports our way of life. Amen? And it sustains our lives. Like, like the, the uh, presumable gold that's in Fort Knox makes our currency worth something. I guess I don't know if it's there or not. Amen. So we wouldn't, and we wouldn't have much of a building here if we didn't have a good foundation, something to build on. There's got to be a good foundation. Now, I like what... Jesus says here in Matthew 21 and four, verse 42, he says, Have you not read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has now been made the head cornerstone? How remarkable. What an amazing thing that God has done. Amen? All right. So a building is only as good as the foundation that it's built on. What am I saying here? Well, in the book of Matthew, once again, chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, we find Jesus asking his disciples here, Who do men say that I am? Now, I don't know. You know, you put yourself in that place, and all, all of his disciples, you know, I'd say his closest disciples, you know, not all of his followers, but they were there, you know. And who do men say that I am? I think that we live in a world today. Who is this Jesus? I think, that's a, I think that that's a question that a lot of people are asking. Who is this Jesus? They don't know who Jesus is. You know, and that's where we come in. Right? Okay. Who do men say that I am? Verse 16. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I can just picture, you know, Jesus said uh, that I will bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever things I've told you, you know. And I think by the same token, you know, because we read here, uh, we go on and read here a little bit. Uh, the Lord, Jesus tells him how, you know, that flesh and blood hadn't revealed that to him, but it was that revelation came by his father. All right. So I get this picture of Peter that coming right up out of him, his belly, his spirit, and he says that, and can you just kind of think, did I say that? Right? You ever said something like that, and you knew that that was the Lord speaking through you. 
that God was speaking through you, a vessel. Praise God. He says, Thou art the Christ, then of the living God. Jesus said, Upon this rock. Now that word rock there in the Greek is Petra, a huge bedrock. That's what Petra means. All right? He said, Upon this rock. It wasn't Peter. Peter wasn't a rock because Peter in the Greek is Petros. That would have been a piece of detached rock. That's what Petros means. All right. So he's talking about the Petra. He was talking about upon this rock, upon this truth, upon this foundation. Jesus was saying, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church isn't built on Peter. The church is built on Peter's confession that Jesus was the son of the living God. Amen. The death the burial, and most of all, the truth of his resurrection that Jesus Christ rose from the dead validates our Bible, the Word of God, and all that it stands for. Praise God. I always, uh, whenever I'm talking to somebody that doesn't know this awesome truth, and they, they have another religion or something like that or whatever they want to call it, you know, I always say... Do you have a champion? Do you have a champion? Do you have someone that overcame death, hell, and the grave? They laid their life down willingly, and then they picked it back up again three days later. Jesus is the only one that's ever done that. Our champion, son of the living God. That validates Christianity. None of the other religions of the world have anything that even comes close to that. That's why they're... They're working their way to heaven, trying to anyway, but they're not even going to get close to it. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. All right? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 26, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will compare him to a man who built his house upon a rock. We're talking about truth, having your loins girt about with the truth. So we're talking about the truth that we're girding ourselves with. He says, and when the rains came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, it fell not because it was built upon a rock. Amen. So it was built upon a firm foundation. It was built upon the truth. Relationships are built on truth. All right. Our relationship with God is based upon truth. Even love is based upon the truth. 1 Corinthians 13 and 6 says, Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but what rejoices in the truth. I know the love of the 60s. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. That's not agapeo. That's not agape love. That's eros love. Employment. Employment would be real hard to work for someone who lied to you all the time, right? There has to be trust. There has to be truth. And, you know, and, and by the same token, it would be real hard having someone to work for you that lies to you all the time. There has to be trust. So if there's no truth, there's no honor. There's no loyalty. There's no integrity. There can be no trust. Proverbs 12, 17 says, He that speaks forth truth shows forth righteousness. Without truth in our lives, we cannot stand against the enemy. He can't stand the truth. There's no truth in the, in the enemy. He's the father of lies. That's our, that's our defense, the truth. You know, that's, and that's one thing that he wants believers to do. He wants us to suppress what the Word of God says because it's like kryptonite to him. <laughs> right? You can't take it. Amen? So, because the truth is the only thing that will prevail against him. Satan, Shaitan, is the father of lies, and he cannot stand the truth. So we are armed with a very, very powerful weapon. With our loins girt about with truth, we will have nothing to be ashamed of, because no lie can withstand the truth. So, 
This was the first piece of armor that Paul talks about. God is truth. Romans 3 and 4 says, let God be true and every man be a liar. You know, there's all kinds of people out there. They come up with their own theories. They come up with their own philosophies about stuff. They've tried to pollute the gospel with all of that. Ain't going to make it. The truth will stand. Amen? John 4, 24 says, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Psalms 33 and 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's who Jesus is. Amen? He's the word. He is God, manifest in the flesh. Verse 14, And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and what? Truth. Now, why does it say here to have your loins girt about with truth? Let's look at this. We're going we're to turn to Genesis, the first chapter. Going back, this is the book of beginnings. The book of Genesis. Chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. It says here, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. He goes on, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Okay, in verse 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created he, them. And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. Subdue it. So I believe that our loins are the reproduction area of our bodies. Jesus said, or the word in the beginning, he said, be fruitful and multiply. He said, reproduce after your own kind. Could that be, you know, he said not to be unequally yoked. All right? So we're going to reproduce after our own kind, full of truth. All right? He says here in 2 Corinthians six fourteen, Paul says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness or being in right standing with God what does that have to do with unrighteousness or iniquity or lawlessness or what communion has light with darkness so I believe Jesus is in the duplication business that's what he spent those three and a half years duplicating himself into his disciples into his followers he was into reproduction he was reproducing himself the truth into others Jesus said, I'm the truth. And I want to reproduce this truth in you. And Paul says, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I believe, he says to gird your loins about with this truth. Because God wants you to reproduce this same truth that was reproduced in us. He wants us to reproduce in others. After our own kind. Reproducing the truth. Amen? Amen. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 8, Freely you have received, so freely give. Amen. So in order for us to multiply and to be reproducing this truth, we need to be talking the talk and walking the walk, girding our loins with the truth. That's why it's so important that we, that, uh, we be confessing the word all the time. It's called sowing seed to do what? Produce a harvest. Amen. Just connecting the dots here. John 8, 31, 32. Jesus says, if you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. God is truth. Amen. So that wraps up 
talking about this first piece of armor. And I believe next week uh, we will be talking about the breastplate of righteousness. But before we dismiss, we have a confession that I'd like for us to, to confess together. It's about putting on the whole armor of God. We need to confess this every day. I think maybe it's on the next one. Anyway, I gird my loins with truth today. I will walk in the truth. I will multiply in truth. I will be victorious in the truth. Because the devil cannot overcome the truth. Amen. Father, we praise you tonight, Lord God, for the truth, Lord God. Lord, you spoke the truth into us, Father God. You have reproduced this truth within us, Father God. You have commissioned us to go forth and make disciples of all men. Father, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you that you have entrusted the truth within us, Father God. We're thankful, Lord God, to understand that we are in a warfare. And, and we understand also, Lord, we read the back of the book, and we know that we're winners, Lord God. We're on the winning team, Team Jesus. Amen. But we also know that there's a battle. There's a war going on. There's a battle to be fought. And, Father God, help us, Lord God, because, Lord, we're fighting for the lives of souls here, Lord God. There's so many that need to hear the truth. Lord, and we have determined in our hearts that we will not shut up, we will not sit down, we will not back down, but we will go forward, praise God, overcoming darkness with the light of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand. If anybody needs prayer tonight, if anybody wants to come up and we have our prayer team. Anybody that wants to come up and to come on up and, and pray with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. We'll do one more song. If you need prayer, come on up. Amen. And you there at home. You can receive Jesus Christ. He's the truth. Amen. He loves you. He wants you to reach out to him right now. Just reach out. What have you got to lose? If you've not accepted him, what have you got to lose? What are you hanging on to? You know, everything in this world, everything in it is going to perish. But he says, my word will stand forever. Try him. Let him, let him prove himself to you. He told his disciples, come and follow me. Check me out. Check me out. See if the words that I speak are the words of my Father who sent me. You know what, everybody? Over here at the house of prayer, we've been following Jesus. We've been checking him out. And he is the most realest thing that we've ever found in our lives. He, 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 turned, he got us stopped on the highway to hell, and he's given us life. Check it out. Check it out. Just call on his name. Amen. Would you come? Jesus. I'm going to turn my mic on up here. Check.
Father, we want to thank you tonight, Lord, for your word, for it is truth. We thank you, Lord God, Lord, for seeing us a long way off, Lord God, and bidding us to come, Lord God. You spoke to our hearts, Lord. You've, you turned our world upside down, Lord God. You shook us at our core, Lord God, and we're thankful, Lord. We're thankful for that place that's called between a rock and a hard place, because that's where many of us, Lord, turned our lives over to you. And, Lord God, you redeemed us. You rescued us, Lord God. You found, you found a worth. Uh, you found value in our life that we matter to you, Lord. And we're thankful for that, Father God. Lord, we're just thankful, Lord God, that, uh, uh, that we had this time together here tonight, Lord God. And we're just thankful, Lord, for uh, safety on the on the road home, Lord, for uh, all of our brothers and sisters, Father God. Help us to meditate upon your word. Help us to sow some seed tomorrow, Lord God. Help us to reproduce this truth out there into the lives of others, Father. Lord, we give you a praise tonight in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We say, come, Lord Jesus, come. We say, come, Lord Jesus, come. We say, 
Say, come. 